welcome back to Ox Tools. I'm Tom. So Merry Christmas 2017. Uh, we got a batch of Christmas meatloaf for you guys. Um, this pile of madness here is uh, some special uh, Christmas ornaments for machinists. So we'll check those out in a little while. I'm getting ready to pack them up and ship them out actually all over the world, which is pretty neat. Um, we'll see what, uh, what those little guys are and, and how they can be used. Anyway, I got a bunch of neat stuff for you guys. I've been saving up for a while. Um, and let's go look at it. All right, so um, those of you that follow my channel um, saw me building this thing here. This is a, uh, it's a, what I call a composite square, a composite master square. Um, and for those that are, di that are just seeing this fresh, the idea is it, it sits like this. Um, and it's, it's a perpendicularity reference uh, for the surface plate. Uh, it's, I have one, but this is a, a larger one. Now, what's interesting about this particular one um, is um, it's made out of mild steel, just low carbon steel. But what I did was I had it uh, carburized. And uh, what that means is that they heat it up and they pack it with a carbon source and they infuse carbon into the surface. So it's case hardened. It has a, a, ver a very hard case on a soft core, uh, which is kind of neat. Um, anyway, uh, there was some, uh, and, and this isn't finished yet. There's quite a bit more work to be done on this. Um, it, was, it was just rough ground, uh, uh, reasonably accurately, and before it went out for carburization. And the reason was I wanted to kind of study how this thing would move around, you know, when uh, during that heat treat. And the surprise is it's actually pretty good. It didn't move around very much at all. Um, the case depth here is, is over a millimeter thick. It's a millimeter and a half uh, case depth. And the surface hardness is 64 Rockwell C scale. Um, in fact, you can see here, uh, maybe, there's some little some little divots here where they actually checked it. Um, I don't know where, I, I haven't looked on every single surface to see if they checked it in other places, but these are certainly uh, look like Rockwell marks. Um, and guys that follow me on Instagram, I kind of threw out um, <laughs> um, a, I don't know, question. So we're trying to decide, uh, I want to paint this this intersection here. This will all be ground steel here, uh, where I have it masked off. But the rest of it is going to get painted. And uh, I posted some uh, some uh, different color choices uh, that I might use. I was kind of partial to this 1127 orange, but uh, I think I've kind of changed my tune since then. So um, if you have a <laughs> If you have an opinion, uh, let me know and why, and because uh, it's kind of an interesting thought, you know. Um, so the whole inside of this will all be painted, and the contrast will be precision ground, precision ground steel. So uh, anyway, what's so you know what's a what's a good one? What do you think? Anyway, the let's take a look at this though, and what we're gonna do is, and I'll probably have to shoot this from another angle. What I have here is this is a a precision toolmaker straight edge here and what we'll do is we can just lay that on the surface and um, if there's a strong light behind it and I have such a light in my pocket here and let's see if I can do this and uh, so is that coming through yeah okay so you can see out at the ends here there's a little bit of uh, there's a little bit okay but it's not it's not significant. That's what's impressive. Uh, so it's got some little wavies, okay. Um, let's move it a little closer here. Let's get some little wavies. But it's not bad at all. And it's, you know, it's kind of the same going this way. I don't need to reset it for that. Um, anyway, uh, uh, I'm pleasantly surprised um, how little I'm going to have to grind off of this. Now, I got a, a nice deep case depth. Uh, in case I had, you know, it moved around a lot and I had to, uh, I had to grind a lot. But first step is it's going to get painted. Uh, and you can see I started masking uh, uh, in preparation to do that. And then uh, we'll go uh, grind our brains out on this thing and, um, and get it nice and straight. 
and perpendicular and I have my little adjusters here that you can see so the idea is this tapered screw can actually move this foot just subtly uh, uh, to dial in that last uh, that last little fussy little bit so let's put that away all right yeah I'll take a look at the bottom there so anyway so none of the welds cracked nothing kind of fell apart and um, so structurally I think we're in good shape so uh, stay tuned for that paint and then grind and then inspect all right this next one this is the, uh, the, the Christmas ornaments that I mentioned in the, the beginning of the video. Um, what this is here is, uh, and you guys will get a kick out of these. These are miniature surface plates. Um, these are grade A, two ledge, uh, two inch by three inch uh, surface plates. And you're going, what the hell do you use those for, right? Uh, well, I'll show you uh, a real cool usage of, uh, of one of these. Um, Anyway, uh, um, I have an old, or had an old salesman sample. Uh, you know, these granite surface plate folks would go out in the field and, uh, and you know, peddle their wares. And uh, I think they had some little salesman samples that they used to show, um, you know, features. And, uh, you know, I, maybe they even gave them away. I don't even know. So, uh, let's see which one. Yeah, okay. Let's label up. Anyway, I, uh, I had some made by Standridge, my uh, friends down at Standridge, and um, I advertised these on Instagram, um, or I showed it on Instagram at one point, the, uh, my original one, and people seemed interested, so I said, hey, what the heck, I'll just have some made. And I did, and um, um, as you can see, they all sold. Um, <laughs> they sold in four hours, so uh, I think it was a, a reasonable idea. Anyway, I'm going to have some more made, and uh, it takes about a month to have them made, and um, so I'm going to order some more. And anyway, if you guys are interested, uh, leave a comment in the comments if you're interested in one, and um, I'll give you guys a heads up again when, uh, when some more are available. But let's go look at uh, how we can use these. Okay, so here's my, here's my original one, and um, what I have, what I've done with it, Let's take this off and set this aside for a sec. Um, there's, there's my original one there, and it's an old Collins micro flat. <clears throat> and I showed this on, uh, on Instagram, and people, you know, they thought it was cute and all that. And, uh, uh, but there's actually kind of a neat use of this, and I can thank a friend of mine, uh, Gordon Long, for, uh, for turning me on to the idea. Um, now, what I've done is I've, uh, and I haven't had a chance to... Uh, <laughs> That's the, the problem with these ideas, you know, you just start using them and uh, you never finish them up, but uh, that needs to be surface ground to be nice. But uh, I bonded a steel disc to the uh, the bottom of the uh, the opposite side of the, the good face. And uh, so what you can do is you can stick a magnet on uh, an indicator holder. Um, and what Gordon had done is he actually, he actually bonded a whole uh, um, surface gauge to the top of his, which is... You know, you can do that too, so. But the idea is here is now we have a kind of a cool floating indicator base, but more importantly, what we can do, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time getting the indicator zero, but let's say we have a something on the surface grinder and we wanna check it uh, without removing it from the chuck. This is the key. So we've got a gauge block stack here. We're gonna zero up on our gauge blocks now. We're gonna pop this loose. Let's go over to the surface grinder and uh, see how that works. All right, so we're, we're over here. The magnet's on right now. I'll just take it off, okay. Turn it back on, okay. So the problem is when you take measurements uh, from this surface down to here with a, say a depth mic, your depth mic gets magnetized and it makes it, it's kind of tricky to take measurements. Well. With our nice uh, with our nice granite base here, we can slide around. Let's see now. I didn't set it very good, but um, I think you get the idea here. Is our nice granite base? It doesn't care that the magnet's on, and uh, you know, for all functional uh, purposes, you know, this is ground very flat, and it's it's behaving like a surface plate. So if we have a height gauge uh, that we can use to check things or features uh, on a part that's on the surface grinder that we really don't, you know, maybe we have a fancy setup here. This is not a particularly fancy setup um, that we don't want to disturb or take off um, just because we spent a lot of time. 
you can actually go on there and actually uh, kind of qualify some of those features. So uh, this is a this is really a good use of uh, of a little piece of granite like this. And uh, what better thing to have than a, a little mini surface plate that has a known flatness on it? Uh, anyway, this just glides on here quite nicely, and uh, um, you know Bob's your uncle, so to speak. So anyway, that's one way you can use those things. And let's go look at something else. Let's take a look at this next one here. What we have here, um, these are kind of uh, some real old school optical dividing um, rotary tables, basically. Um, I have been, I need some help from uh, the internet out there. I've done a little bit of research on the internet and I've actually even called this company, which is uh, the WE, L. E. Gurley Company and asked them if they have any literature or manual or any instructions or whatnot on on how you actually use these things. So, and I have been unsuccessful. There's very little on the web um, that I've found. A couple of references to old 1930s uh, machinery magazine um, that just have a little blurb on them. But the idea is that uh, these are actually capable of uh, dividing the circle directly to arc seconds. Um, and, you know, we've talked about this before. That's, you know, 1,296,000 divisions, right? So those are very, very small angular divisions, right? Um, and the, the ability to do that directly is, is fairly impressive, okay? Now, these guys um, actually have a patent on some of this stuff. And it has, this, it has a uh, basically what looks like an optical encoder disc that has uh, divisions on it, okay? And the, uh, it has two optical paths here uh, that look at both sides of, of that circle at the same time. So what this does is this, um, the, the idea is that it cancels any, any errors that are caused by, that are caused by runout, which would cause an angular error. And, uh, so it's comparing simultaneously both sides of the scale, 180 degrees apart, which is pretty cool. Um, now, I haven't quite sorted out how to, <laughs> how to use them. Now, I can make it move, I can read the scales, I can do this, but the logic of how you actually make a one-second index escapes me at this point. And uh, because there is no mechanical connection between the scale that... Uh, you can read directly seconds and the, the scale that you can read down to uh, handfuls of minutes. So it's, a, it's more than I can explain in a, in a, in a simple video. So I'm going to try to get you a, a view down the, uh, the viewfinder here so you guys can get a, get a sense of what we're looking at down there. And uh, it takes two light inputs here, one in each side, one there and one there. Um, and then there's some this is, I believe, the more interesting one, um, although <laughs> I don't know yet. This has a display here that you can act actually, you know what, maybe this would be a better one to light up here. Uh, so yeah, maybe I'll light this one up and you guys can get a, because uh, this one you can see the, you can see the scales in this little window here. So maybe we'll do that one. But this has some notable mechanical features on this table that, uh, that are worth uh, taking a look at. So let's scope that out. All right. Let's take a look at this top plate first. So basically, it's a it's a rotary table here, and uh, it has a a worm gear here that we can rotate it in a precise way. And this worm gear is actually pretty neat because it has a uh, it's a dual differential. It's got a high and a low speed. It's a differential screw. So when you when you rotate it one way, you can get a very 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 tiny increments, and then it comes up against the stop which it just did and now you can move it uh, a little faster so it's pretty uh, it's pretty cool uh, I've never seen anything like that before um, anyway let's take this top off and you can get a look at it so what, what these screws are here it's kind of like a four jaw chuck okay and what you can do is you can you can center this plate so whatever you put on here you can get it you know spot on the center of rotation which is pretty cool um, and let, let's take it off so you can get a look at it okay and there's the screws and what's neat is they index with these little angled notches here and you can see they're angled kind of down right uh, and, the, and what the idea is is that when you drive it into those it pulls the table down too which is pretty neat 
So let's set that back on there. Let's see. Spot. And then um, the other thing it has here is, is it has three points, three leveling points. So now we can we can catch the uh, um, the rotation, and then we can also catch the uh, the flatness. And if you think about it, that's probably not a bad way to create a lathe faceplate, for example, right? So imagine this was on the lathe. We could center up, right? And then we could uh, we could true it up um, by turning these screws to uh, to make a real dead nuts uh, flat plane on the uh, on the lathe, flat and concentric with rotation. So let's run those in so we can not worry about dropping that off. And then this is just a uh, this is just a break here that breaks you know that locks the whole uh, the whole thing. All right, and um, so let's see. So there's the name. It's a it's a girly. G U R L E Y Unisec. That's the name of it, and uh, it was relatively famous for being uh, an op uh, optical dividing engine that uh, could um, divide to uh, seconds of arc. Um, and then, so let's uh, let's let's try to get a look through the viewfinder of the other one. I'll see if I can light it up well enough, and uh, we can get a look. Okay, actually, this is going to work pretty good. So. Let me. I'll just point a few things out. So we have the main degree, the main degree scale here, okay. And this has a split line in between it here, and I'll move it. You can kind of see it. All right. So that's what I mean. It's got two optical paths that are looking at each side of this circular disc, right? So one one side of the disc is here. The other side is is over here. All right. And uh, so I'll move it one degree, and you can see. There's 181 and 1. Okay. All right. So let's let's bring it back to zero. I'm trying to do this through the viewfinder here. So okay, that's kind of close. Now this lower scale here, down here, this is the uh, this is the the second scale. In fact, you can see it's moving. It's moving that. Now what's interesting is yeah it's moving that okay but it's actually not moving the rotary table okay so if I make an index okay let's see that's I forgot now I forgot what the scale is here I think that's minutes minutes and seconds yeah one minute two minute three minute okay so this has a total range of I think it was so it's, 30 minutes? What was it? Uh, I can't, I can't quite, eh. It's a problem. The camera's right in the way and I can't quite see it here. Six, what is it? Seven. Let's keep going. Ten, okay, yeah. Ten minutes. So, yeah, that actually makes sense. So that's ten minutes and so each one of the lines between here is ten minutes, right? Okay. Yeah. All right. So you can make a you can index between um, each hash mark here. So by going full scale on this one. Okay, that's what it was. I didn't quite remember that. All right. Now what's interesting though is it's yeah it's shifting the the optical path and here if we look at that we those little the tiniest ticks in there and they're hard to see are seconds. Now you might go oh well you just make that uh, um, you know you make the move on the optical part then you actually move the rotary table right well yeah in theory that does work right but I would disagree that these tiny hash marks you can't you can't they're they're too fine you can't detect that kind of movement and uh, uh, is is my argument so um, and, and you know maybe that's how it works, right? And you just got to have really good eyes, which I don't. And um, but anyway, like I said, I'm looking for information on these things. If anybody has an old manual kicking around uh, or manages to track one down on the web somehow, I'd really appreciate uh, getting pointed at that. That would be really neat. Um, the company was no help. Uh, They're like, oh my God, no, we don't have anything on that. That's long gone, ancient history blah 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 sorry we can't help you and uh, so they you know they make modern encoder discs now and uh, surveying equipment and stuff like that but 
nothing like this. Anyway, uh, I thought you guys would get a kick out of this. Somebody gave me these to, and said, here, play with these. <laughs> and so here I am playing with them and uh, messing around. So uh, they're kind of unique, uh, unique in instruments. And then let's see, I'll slide it over here. There's the patent number, right? Okay, for folks that uh, want to take a look at the patents on this. And basically, I think the patent is uh, uh, the dual optical path uh, uh, concept here. So anyway, Gurley Unisec, uh, pretty cool. Looking for information. Thanks, guys. All right, this next one's pretty cool. Um, actually, this is something that you can buy. Um, this comes from a friend of mine. Uh, some of you may know him uh, as the tool and die guy. Uh, this is uh, Phil Kerner, uh, and he's the uh, the tool and die guy. And he has a he has a bunch of videos, and um, he has a uh, kind of a pay per view site that you can uh, that you can join and access some of his um, his trade knowledge there. He's got oh, I don't know several hundred videos. Uh, put it that way. Anyway. Uh, uh, Phil and I actually uh, we've developed a friendship over the last few years, and uh, we talk, uh, you know, about once a month. Uh, we call and have a, you know, hour, hour and a half conversation, and just kind of talk about stuff and uh, tools and p training people in the trades and you know things like that. Anyway, uh, I showed his calendar last year, and uh, which I bought a couple of his calendars, and they were actually really cool. He went through his toolbox. Pulled out a bunch of neat stuff. Well, he's done it again. Uh, this is the 2018 uh, calendar, and you, there's probably enough time still to uh, order one and uh, uh, get one for yourself. And uh, in the uh, description below, uh, there's a link, uh, and he Phil's been nice enough to have a discount uh, for the uh, Ox Tools viewers. So uh, log on to his thing if you want a calendar, and you can get a little discount. But let's take a look at it because there's always something cool in one of Phil's calendars. So let's check it out. He he calls it a boutique calendar, so <laughs> which is kind of neat. Uh, this is a shot from um, Kerner Tool and Die uh, from back in the day here, 1958. And some tool maker at the bench, uh, he doesn't uh, know who it is, but uh, it's still a cool black and white picture. And a uh, big old vice on the table there, kind of neat. Um, let's see, uh, a little message from, from the tool and die guy. Let's keep, keep going here. Um, so here he's showing some of his well-used um, uh, shop reference books. And this is, uh, you know, most a lot of new guys uh, or a lot of young folks uh, they really find everything that they want to find on the web um, but there's 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 a value to owning books and uh, and I'll just say it is that when you open them up um, you're not actually searching for something when you when you just crack one open and many times you find gems that you didn't think you needed to know and um, uh, that's really really I don't know, maybe a little bit harder to do on the web because uh, it's not, I don't know, you still run into stuff. So, but books, I think, um, if you sit there and flip through them, um, um, there's just something about them and uh, uh, this joy of discovery of all this stuff. And I, I'm a book guy, so you can't tell. <laughs> but uh, and I have a lot of books and so does Phil, apparently. So uh, there are some good ones here. It, all right, let's keep going here. Oh, this is neat. So, this is a real old time, old time deal here. In fact, I think I got some. I got some here. I so these are called tool chits, and um, the way these work, and it's just a wonderful system, is you know you were issued a, a pile of these uh, when uh, you became a you know, when you started working somewhere, and this is Anson Tool, and Phil worked there. And you'd go up to the tool room and there'd be a guy in the tool room or a gal in the tool room and you'd say, hey, I need a 12 inch micrometer. And they say, okay. And they'd go get one and they'd, they'd take a chit from you like this. And that's, that's one a friend of mine gave me. Uh, these are from ClickLock, which is a packaging machinery company. And, um, and where that 12 inch micrometer was hanging up in the tool room, they would put your chit there. And uh, so at the end of the day, they, uh, or if somebody came, uh, you know, later in the day and said, hey, I need a 12-inch micrometer, they'd go look and they'd say, hey, go talk to, uh, uh, go talk to Phil. He's got the 12-inch micrometer, right? Maybe he's done with it. And, um, uh, but it was also a way of keeping track of who had what. 
It's a, it's a real simple system, works great. And, um, you know, these brass tags, uh, some of them are more ornamental than these, but uh, uh, it's just kind of a neat idea. Now it's just a, you know, most shops that I see, it's pretty much a free for all. Um, so, all right, let's keep going here. All right, some more of my kilometers. Um, I can't read this upside down, sorry guys. It's, he's got his, uh, um, these all look like sterrets to me. That's a sterret, that's a sterret. And that certainly looks like a sterret to me. So I think Phil's a big sterret fan, which is nothing wrong with that. Um, sterret makes some, makes some sweet stuff. Okay, uh, now there's a, there's a tool maker's hammer. It's got a little magnifying glass in it. Um, you've got some um, round center punches and um, of various sizes. So when you're doing real fine layout work, uh, you use really tiny ones to, to really nail those intersections, and that's what the, the magnifying glass is for. Now, the only bad part about these kind of center punches is they roll off the bench, and then they inevitably fall on the tip. They never fall on the tail end, they always fall on the tip, so pretty much guaranteed. But that's a neat hammer. That's a Starrett Toolmaker's hammer. What else we got here? Um, this looks like parallels that he made. All right. Uh, one set of parallels. Yeah. Now, actually, you know, it's funny because parallels are, you know, it looks really dog simple, right? But uh, there's a lot of work in them, and then getting them square all the way around um, without warping them while you grind them uh, can sometimes be a challenge. It depends what you make them out of, but uh, uh, especially thin ones. Um, it's easy to overheat them, and uh, then they, they tend to curl when you grind them, and it's just kind of a pain sometimes. Excuse me. Um, what's next? Oh, this is neat. Um, this is a little, it's a miniature sign bar um, that has a sliding um, uh, diamond on it, and so you can dress surface grinder wheels off at an angle. So you... Um, you put gauge blocks into there, under there to, to your prescribed angle, and then by hand you grab this thing and you ch -ch 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 -ch, and you, you feed the you feed the diamond over and uh, you, you scrub a little bit off of the side of the wheel until you until you address your angle. Now Phil, he's a he's a uh, detail oriented, and you'll notice he's got a little piece of paper, or a little piece of felt in there. That way, you're not steel on steel because uh, that's a little place that uh, corrosion can start right at that interface so he's done a nice job and my guess is that's probably got a little bit of oil on it and he's clamped it down on that so that uh, he doesn't get any corrosion under there that's a cute little one there I don't know what is it uh, I didn't say what size it is but it looks like two and a half inch or two inch maybe something like that pretty cool uh, magnetic uh, transfer blocks um, you can make these so uh, you got steel pins or iron pins in a uh, in a uh, non-magnetic material like brass or aluminum. Uh, these look like they're brass. Um, pretty handy. Uh, you can do a precision setup um, instead of grinding your whole chuck. You can just grind these little areas here, and uh, so it's a lot less grinding to get a real true surface to set something on. Then you can put your part on here, and it'll trans. Uh, transfer the magnetic flux up to your part. Uh, not not this particular thing, but that's the idea. Um, that's how those work. Let's see what else we got. Um, oh, okay, it's a squareness comparator here. Uh, so uh, checking a block uh, for perpendicularity. I've shown these several times. There's many different varieties. This is one that's uh, uh, been built up out of a surface gauge. Uh, so it has a uh, can I grab one real quick? Yeah, I can grab one real quick. Um, so it's kind of like this here. Very similar to this. And it's got a little shoe in the front. And you grind a groove in there and you press in a, uh, a curved piece that you rock against the, uh, against the block and then you, you, know, you catch it with the indicator on the top. So um, very handy for squaring up blocks uh, to very close limits. So that's what that one's about. Let's keep going. Oh, this is really cool. I saw this before, yeah. Um, so this is this, uh, this is pretty cool. So this is like miniature tool, uh, miniature machine, machine tools. And um, 
uh, these are kind of handy for laying out uh, shop spaces uh, and visualizing that. This is all pre-CAD, guys, okay? Um, so, uh, but uh, these are actually pretty detailed. So Marco Tenzi would be uh, real interested in seeing this because uh, you got a surface grinder there. You've got bridge ports. You've got, uh, uh, I don't know what that is. Oh, uh, Arbor Press? Yeah. Jig bore? I don't know. It's hard to tell upside down. <laughs> anyway, this is pretty cool. Um, you know, kind of machinist furniture there, or dollhouse furniture, right? And they're quarter scale, so you can kind of lay out a, a plant with these and uh, get some idea of the space you need around machines and whatnot. So, pretty cool. Um, various blocks and sign bars and stuff. What else? My collection of... Homemade one, two, three blocks, vices, V blocks, and sign bars. Um, he 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 showed some of this on his last uh, his last calendar. But this picture is kind of neat in that uh, it's the way he's got it uh, lit and framed here. It's uh, this is what you would see when you open that drawer in his Gerstner chest and uh, that stuff. Uh, you know, and as you build more stuff, you just start wedging it in tighter and tighter. So I imagine this drawer is pretty heavy in, uh, in Phil's toolbox there. And then uh, this is an homage to uh, Blueprints, or in this case, more correctly, Blue Line. Um, so, you know, Phil and I grew up in the, in the days when uh, guys worked on drafting boards and uh, worked on vellum and then they made uh, uh, prints to go out in the shop on paper uh, and they used a, a diazo uh, process that used ammonia and the, the smell of that process is uh, is very distinctive and it produces these these nice bright blue lines and uh, uh, and a lot of memories right now because now you just get well now what i get at work is uh, screenshots <laughs> lots of screenshots so uh uh, people uh, get a little bit lazy when it gets down to the, the drawing level these days. So, uh, but anyway, that's uh, from the good old days of uh, drafting boards and uh, and uh, blue line drawings. Now, I want I want to mention something at this juncture here. There is value in learning how to draft on the board, and uh, as opposed to a CAD program. And what that is is that teaches you how to do layout work, right? Because uh, it's the same when you get out in the shop and you have to scribe things or mark things and, and do those kinds of operations, lay things out at an angle and, and do all that kind of stuff. And this is practice for that work. Um, and if you've never done it, then you'll be fairly clumsy at it. And, uh, uh, but it's still used in shops and, uh, and it's a valuable skill. So, um, you know, if you ever want to have some fun, uh, get a little drafting board and, uh, and draw some stuff and uh, um, appreciate what it takes to, uh, to learn that skill and do a really nice job with it, too. So, um, and it's still, still, still useful today. All right, what do we got here? Um, oh, uh, these are kind of cool. So these are uh, edge finders here. Um, for picking up edges on, um, on angled surfaces. Um, and I think I've shown these before. I have a couple of various ones, but these are, these are homemade ones here. It's got a precision diameter attached to a precision plate, and you can lay that on a, an angled surface and determine where the corner is. So when you're doing angular setups, it's, uh, it's real handy for that. And then he's got some tooling balls, it looks like, and. Uh, uh, I don't know. I can't see what the rest of that is, but uh, anyway, so that's December. So I think we're we're pretty much to the end here. So anyway, if you, uh, you want to get one of those calendars, check the link. You can get a little discount. Uh, I don't know what he's charging for these, and uh, um, but uh, you know, help out a fellow metal, metal worker if you if you feel like it. So uh, tools of the trade by Phil Kerner. All right. So the this is the uh, has been the the big uh, off-camera project lately for me. Um, this is a new addition to the shop. Um, it's a Brown & Sharp uh, 618 MicroMaster. And I, uh, I bought this from a, from a friend of mine. <laughs> Actually, it's kind of a funny story. Uh, I threw a, this was a public auction, and I threw a kind of a spec bid on it. I went and looked at the machine and threw kind of a chicken, chicken bid on it. And, uh, 
I get a phone call from him and he says, hey, what are you doing? And uh, I go, what do you mean? He goes, you're bidding on that surface grinder. And, I, and it turns out that he wanted it. And uh, I was like, oh, okay. So I kind of backed off and he actually won it. And then uh, um, he got it in his shop and uh, quickly ran out of room and wasn't using it. So uh, he asked me if I wanted it. And so anyway, here it is. So the Taft Pierce is going to uh, eventually leave when I get this thing fully operational. Uh, what's really cool actually is uh, right now, uh, Robin Renzetti is reconditioning uh, an 818 Mitsui. So we're basically on parallel paths right now. I'm working on this one and he's working on the Mitsui actually faster than I am because uh, you know he works out of his home shop and I have a regular day job. But anyway, when I come home, I work on this a little bit. and. Uh, um, it's in actually really good shape. Uh, it's a 1965 machine, something like that. Full hydraulics. I'll fire it up in a sec and you can see it run. Um, anyway, it's got some little problems, but nothing, uh, nothing serious. Everything's in real nice shape. Um, I had to f work on the, uh, the lube system a little bit. Uh, the, the little metering orifices uh, uh, were gummed up, so I got new ones and replaced those and blew down the lines. and. Got that all running properly now. So, uh, but let's uh, let's fire it up, and uh, you can hear it. And for those of you that have watched any of my surface grinding videos, uh, that Taft Pierce is pretty noisy, uh, although it grinds really nicely. This one is much quieter here, um, as you'll hear, considerably quieter. So, uh, uh, much more pleasant on the ears. So. Full hydraulic. And it has hydraulic uh, cross speed too. Um, it also uh, has a neat feature. Uh, it has a rapid traverse feature too. And um, it has a, a, a dressing speed too. So you can dress the wheel hydraulically uh, at a, a very constant, accurate speed. So, kind of neat. Um, so there's still some work left to be doing on, done on it, and uh, you guys will get to see this thing livened up, and uh, we'll do some. Uh, my plan is to grind that big composite square on this uh, if I can get this running pretty soon, so uh, uh, or operational, so I can do some test grinding at least. So uh, um, I suppose I could do it now. Um, one interesting thing I did here, and uh, I may show a, a couple of little video clips of it, is I took the magnetic chuck apart and rebuilt it. So um, some of you guys may be interested in that, but the video clips didn't go um, as, well as, <laughs> as well as I hoped because uh, I took it apart and then I said, oh, you know what, this would make really good video, dumbbell, you should just video this. So I kind of put it back together and then I took it apart a second time and it, it kind of didn't go the same way and, uh, and I was a little bit annoyed at myself for not capturing it on video the first time. but. Uh, I'll pull a clip out of there and you can kind of see the guts of the, uh, uh, of the magnetic chuck. But anyway, it's all cleaned out internally and re-lubricated and operates slicker than a weasel snot. So uh, uh, anyway, so that's what I've been working on kind of off camera uh, in my, uh, my quiet time where I got the radio cranked up and I'm um, just in the shop having some fun. So anyway, stay tuned for more. There we go. So now you can see you can see some of the scunge that's on here and you can see part of the mechanism here. Um, this is what actually lifts the, the magnet pack up and transfers it from one side to the other. Um, so next stage is uh, we're going to remove this uh, aluminum center section here. So this is a non-magnetic uh, um, ring that's around this and we'll get that off next and then separate it from the last plate actually you can see this, this is dragging it back and forth uh, actually maybe you know what let's just keep going here maybe we uh, we can get it off of the dowel yep there we go get it off of the dowel pins
this point. So it's, it's not uh, behaving the same way it did when I took it apart the first time, but that's okay. I don't think it matters for what we're doing here. Now here's where you got to be real careful because I got the magnet pack now and what I don't want to do is it to come down on a flat iron surface because <laughs> uh, that would be kind of unfortunate at this point. What I'm trying to do is do that. Okay so now this this is the dangerous part right here this guy and what I want to do is I'm going to set that on some wood off to the side here and just kind of keep it out of my way. So there's the two plates and then we'll look at the magnet pack, we'll flip it over and you can see the uh, see how that's put together. And like I said, I took this apart before, it kind of came apart a little bit differently but uh, um, it's approximately the same. The main thing is to separate it and get wood in between it and as you get separation from the magnet pack, the, the magnetic force drops off pretty quickly. So, um, you know, once you get a couple of slivers of plywood in there, you can, um, um, you can continue on from there and separate it completely. Okay. Okay, this next one's pretty interesting here. What we have here, um, this is a, um, a special indexer. Um, it's kind of like a, a hair egg grind all, but uh, actually, actually much better, I believe. Um, it has the ability to index pretty much any angle that you want, uh, which is unique to uh, indexers um, that you might find. Now, I got this one set up on the uh, on the surface screen. Now, this is an, a recent eBay find. I've sort of been you know, mildly sniffing around for one of these uh, for a while, but uh, they don't come up very often. Um, this was invented by a guy, uh, R.J. Newbold, and he, uh, it says Meadville, Pennsylvania, but uh, he's actually in Hernando, Florida, and he sold the rights to uh, uh, a company in Pennsylvania uh, to manufacture the this particular indexer, uh, and they, they manufacture it faithfully to his design. Uh, they still call it a new bold, new bold indexer. Um, so let's just take a quick let's take a quick look at this. So yes, it rotates. Okay, um, these are stops. It has uh, like a Herrig uh, grind all. It has a, a a shot pin here that indexes for quick indexing every 15 degrees. So it's got a series of notches around it, and this is a tapered. Uh, it's got a wedge-shaped uh, tip on it that wedges into something that looks similar to a gear. Um, and then, then it starts to get more interesting from there, okay? Um, we have another shot pin up here um, that has a tapered pin that engages in a tapered slot in a movable stop. So I can move these stops around the rim here and uh, set up a particular accurate index between two points, which is kind of handy. And it could be any angle, and uh, you'll see that in just a sec. So let's reset that. Um, the other spiffy thing about this is um, it's 5C up the nose of it. And uh, has a little uh, a nut. And this nut is actually really well made. This is like, it works perfectly. Um, Anyway, that sucks to call it up, and uh, you can put things in a collet. They also make a V-block attachment for it. I don't have that, and uh, but I have a, a Herrig that has that uh, that particular feature. So 
that's that uh, the basic functions of that and then uh, let's make sure it's unlocked it has a this particular one has a drive on it and we can we can uh, my knobs missing here so I can use my fingernail okay it actually will get going pretty quick now uh, I just recently discovered uh, something I don't like about it and um, is these particular stops they stick up a lot so um, it, it kind of limits what you can use to space it off of the fence in the back but you know that's kind of a minor first world kind of a problem so <laughs> um, the, the main thing is uh, that, that uh, you have this indexing ability so let's take a look at that here um, actually you know what let me uh, I'm gonna get you in a little closer so we can see this thing uh, doing its business all right, so now we get to look at the uh, kind of the magic of the uh, of the indexer here. So it has a series of uh, of toothed wheels here, and they kind of behave like a um, a little bit like a vernier. So what these are, these are face gears that engage with one another. Okay, so that you can set these increments. Okay, so we can actually set direct minutes, and we can actually set direct seconds, uh, which is pretty impressive. And uh, so we get degrees, minutes, and seconds. So theoretically, this has the ability to do 1,296,000 different combinations, which is like, what? <laughs> That's a lot of combinations. How accurate each one of those are. So, you know, when you're talking arc seconds over, over this kind of distance, um, it's uh, pretty tough to measure that kind of stuff. But um, uh, at least you can set the theoretical uh, exact angle to seconds. Okay. Now let's let's check out how to do that. Um, it's kind of a clever setup uh, how they've done it. So let's just, for the benefit of the uh, the camera here, let's just take part of this apart here. I'm going to take off this back nut. Try not to drop anything on the floor. And this is part of the magic here. Is this last uh, this last disc here with this uh, this plate on it here but let's let's take a peek and there's the face gear there now these are plastic which is kind of surprising right uh, initially but if you think about it uh, when you have that many teeth uh, in engagement um, the load per tooth is actually really really low so uh, it could probably resist a lot of force um, but uh, so there there's the uh, that's the uh, actually the last disc there's the seconds disc okay and it has teeth on both sides okay so that's as far as I'm gonna go here and uh, anyway it's got it's got uh, and this one's fixed to the actual indexer here all right so let's see let me get kind of back on zero there so and I'll show you how to set it which is pretty cool and you can see here actually let's just do that let me yeah set that down so I don't bozo that okay so you can see there that I can index that do do and then it re-engages with the teeth all right so there's 10 degrees offset there okay 20 25 30 okay and the same thing the teeth the tooth spacing is the same on on each on each gear now that doesn't make any sense initially but uh, if you think about it uh, uh, it's a procession uh, between the, the first one and the last one. So, um, um, all right. So let's see. Let's let's set uh, ten degrees. Oops. Actually, uh, sorry. <laughs> I, I said that wrong. I, that was ten minutes. So ten minutes of angle. Okay. Fifteen, twenty minutes. That's the degree wheel. So excuse me. I apologize for that. So if we wanted to set 10 degrees, let's see, let me back up, let me get those two lined up again. Okay. All right, we leave the, so that would be 10 degrees right there. Okay. That would be five degrees, one degree, zero. Okay. And there's 20. Okay. I was, I didn't look at the, uh, I apologize. I wasn't looking at the, uh, the disc. I was just looking at the numbers. So, um, and then if we wanted to set seconds, let me uh, get that back lined up. So there's 10 seconds of arc right there, okay? 
All right, so let's, uh, let's put it back together and then I'll show you the clever part, which is um, um, how you lock that in. And that's this little flat here with this adjustable disc here. All right, so let's get that back on there, like so. Actually, let's lock in at zero. Oop, zero. Okay, all right, be right back. All right, let's go through a setting sequence. So here, this is part of the magic here. This is a, it's a tapered wedge here, and you can see it's, I don't know, three or four degrees, something like that, three degrees. Uh, this is hardened tool steel, and this surface is ground for, to receive this, like so, okay? So we'll go through the kind of setting it. So right now it's, it's on zero. I'm gonna loosen these here. We're, we got an index pin in at zero, and our, our index, uh, wheels are at zero, okay, and now this thing is free to free to move around So what we're going to do is we're going to set our initial setting here by sticking this in and here's the magic of this is this actually Goes in and since it's tapered it goes to absolute zero clearance, right? So I can wedge that in there quite smartly and There's just no it's taking out all the all the play All right, so we'll snug those back down so now we have our, our, initial, our initial setting. And that's coupled, this disc here that the, the wedge is referencing is coupled to the, the indexing array, all right? All right, so let's back that up, put that aside for a sec. So now, as we index, okay, as we index, let me, uh, let me set an angle here. Let's just, I'm just gonna rotate it a little bit. And it's just going to be an arbitrary angle here. Let's do that. So that is 10 degrees. Okay, for example, now lock that back in. All right. And we have it. This is a little index pointer up here. It's hard to get this both in the same shot. So, um, so now what we've done is we've indexed the array 10 degrees. But if we put our wedge back in, and here, that's the tricky part here, is it? Now, the degree wheel, we're set ahead 10 degrees, okay? And it's sweet, all right? And I've taken out all the place. So it wouldn't surprise me if this is fairly repeatable to arc seconds. And um, because of the ability, you know, you're not relying on some super precision fit, right? What you're doing is you're driving a wedge in there um, and taking out all the play. Now, when you're dealing in seconds of arc, the how hard you push this in there probably makes a difference because you're influencing the whole spindle, uh, you know, if we're talking millionths of an inch or micro inches or sub micron kind of things, right? Just me pushing my thumb against this knob is gonna move it around, okay? Everything is kind of rubbery at that level, so uh, uh, take it with a grain of salt. Um, so anyway, that's that's kind of the, uh, the how that indexer work. It's a tooth, a face tooth, uh, indexer. Uh, some people call that kind of a connection a curvic coupling, uh, face gear, um, yeah, things like that. So you can uh, do a little research on your own on that. And uh, so, anyway, like I said, this came up on eBay, and um, uh, it's kind of a mechanical novelty. Um, R.J. Newbold is um, he's a real clever uh, tool maker. He's still alive. He's down in Florida, and uh, he makes. Uh, EDM indexers now, um, and him and his wife uh, do all this precision grinding. He's actually got a, a YouTube channel, in case you didn't know, and uh, there's a link in the uh, in the description. Take a look, and you can check out some of his videos of uh, him doing some uh, high precision grinding. So, uh, anyway, RJ, if you uh, if you catch this video, uh, I'm proud to have one of your uh, one of your cool indexers, and this is he's got a patent on this too. It was uh, unique enough that. Uh, uh, he could get a patent on that. So congratulations on your patent and I uh, hope you're doing well down there in uh, Hernando, Florida. Well, I figured there was probably <laughs> uh, a bunch of people out there that were uh, screaming to see the front of this uh, and I thought better of it. So I, I'm shooting another segment here. So here's the 5C part. You can see that it's a little nose piece and this is actually removable. You put a, you put a rod in there and it unscrews and these are these are match ground at assembly, so they put this together, then they actually grind this taper so that it, uh, it doesn't run out very much. Now, 
your average run-of-the-mill col 5C collets are not particularly great, so uh, take that with a grain of salt. But uh, there's the 5C part. And then what we have here, these are for guide rails for a V-block. So there's a V-block that uh, there's a couple of squares that, that attach in there through these small screws. And then that guides a, um, a V-block up and down that locks in at, in various positions. So you, you kind of, unlike the Herrig, the Herrig has a rack and pinion that you can move it up, move the V-block up and down. This one, you set it a little loose and then you tap it in and, uh, and get the offset that, uh, that you care to have. So usually you're dialing something in uh, for a concentric to, or on, concentric to the rotation. So uh, you tap it around and you lock it down and you loosen it up and you tap it around some more and you keep going that way until you get it as good as you want. But uh, anyway, there's the front part of that. Like I said, I don't have the V-block and it might make a good project to build a V-block that's got uh, uh, and the rails that go with this um, or not because I kind of already have one on a, on a different indexer. But anyway, that's the front of the, uh, the new bold uh, uh, indexer, model 202.